Well, I guess my beginning in the horse business is I had a, a pony when, as soon as I was old enough to crawl on it, so I rode him all over the countryside. And my brother and I, we liked to trade, so we'd get horseback and, and we might leave the house with a sack of rabbits or bandy chickens or pigeons and we'd go swapping and come home that night with something else. So. We, we always had always had a horse to ride, and, and uh, my oldest brother rode jumping horses. So my my first uh, introduction to horses was all English. It was uh, jumpers and gated horses, and I remember in 1966. It was like the fall of '66. I rented a barn in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and started training professionally and there was some gated trainers lived up the road it was Jim and Joanne Torns and they were wonderful friends and uh, they come by every day and told me says now if, if you go if things don't work out riding those quarter horses he said you just come on up the hill and we'll give you a job riding gated horses so I knew I had a job if it didn't work so that was the beginning, and then I was lucky enough that uh, I got some nice horses to ride early on in my career. And, uh, one of the first really outstanding horses I rode was a mare named Oki's Bamboo, and she was a wonderful horse. And I liked her so well, I found out where her sire was, Oki Leo, in Oklahoma. I got to know Dick Roby quite well, and, and uh, I started, oh, I'd save my money and I'd go down there and I'd buy a colt and I'd get it broke. And when I had it about ready to show, I'd sell it to a client uh, and haul it down the road and show it. In those days, uh, that was right, 66 was the year, the year I started training professionally was the first year of the Raynham Fraternity. And I missed the first year, and then my first year at the Fraternity was 67. And uh, the Oki Leos were really good to me. I uh, had a lot of, won a lot of stuff on them. And then in 76, Tom Fuller called me and uh, hired me to start riding the Joe Cody's. And Tom Fuller and the Joe Cody's uh, completely changed my life. I mean, that was the, you know, Tom Fuller and Joe Cody, I'd never rode horses like the Joe Cody's before and never dreamt that you could have a customer as good as Tom. And uh, those years that I rode for him, every year I'd go back there, I'd look at the year with studs because I, I wanted a son of Joe Cody to start my own program. And uh, one year, uh, I went back there and Top Sale Cody was there. And uh, my brother bought him and, and then as two year old, uh, I was starting him and I went ahead and bought my brother out and bought him. And uh, he was really, you know, I had horse studs before that. I had Red B. Moore and I had uh, Oki Power Leo, but I could see right off they, they weren't going, taking me where I wanted to go. But when I got Top Cell Cody, that's when my breeding operation really took off. And you know, I didn't start a breeding operation because I thought it was going to be profitable. Or I didn't start it because I thought I really wanted to be in the breeding business. I started it strictly out of necessity. Back in those days, nobody raised reining horses. And for fraternity prospects, and I immediately got hooked on the fraternity. I mean, that was, as soon as the, the fraternity started, that's all I could think about was the fraternity. So every year I'd start about 30 prospects to find a couple fraternity horses. They'd be reject cutters, reject pleasure horses, reject halter horses, and I, if I started 30 and I found one pretty good one and one that might possibly make it if I work hard enough, it was a good year. So to me it was a no-brainer to study the industry and every time I saw a great showmare, 
Back in those days, once they were used up and their show career was over, they really didn't have much value. And I bought a lot of world's champion mares and some of the better mares in, in the industry in those days for a thousand dollars. I bought the world's champion mare one year, a mare named, uh, she was a little, uh, what was her name? Larry Rose had just won the world on her. She, she was, uh, she was a nifty Della B. She was, and she had a black great pine filly at her side that went on to be the world's champion uh, NRHA non-pro horse. I bought the pair for a thousand. So I started gathering these great brood mares, the, the best reigning, mares that were winning and reigning. And uh, then I bred them to the best that I had. Well, once Top Sail Cody come along, uh, things started working, things started rolling. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it got to where I could start 10 colts and end up with three really good ones. And, and then we kept doing the mares. And then there was a, a boy lived over in Mississippi. The name was Tom Macbeth. And he had a little mare named Jeannie Wisbon. And he brought her to the Jackson, Mississippi when she was just a late two-year-old and beat all of us in the junior random. And she was the biggest stopping, prettiest thing. And then I thought he'd used her up, I mean, running her that hard, that young. Well, for the next 10 years, everywhere you'd go, until he got out of youth, he'd win the youth running, and then he'd come back in the all-age running, and if you couldn't mark a 75, you couldn't beat him. And I, I finally leased her, and I got top sale with. And that little mare, she, he showed her for 10, I think 10 years, uh, never was with a trainer. He told me that one time he had a trainer help him uh, for a couple weeks. And other than that, he'd done it all himself. And uh, that little mare was just incredible and she was beautiful. And uh, so I got her leased and then later on I got her bought. But uh, she produced top sale with and she completely changed the Joe Cody family. Uh, she put that, all the Joe Cody's were monster stoppers. But she put, uh, and they were big, flowy, thoroughbred horses. She modernized them. She really flattened that neck and, and uh, strengthened that loin up where they would stop more modern. She turned them, she changed the Joe Cody family from what we rode in the 60s to what we ride today. She just completely modernized everything. And, of course, when Wiz come along, then it was just off we go. He he was uh, uh, he, he was so special. And the thing about Wiz, you could breed him to a hot mare, and he'd quiet it down. You could treat, breed him to a dead-bellied old lazy mare, and he'd put some sting in it. And you could breed him to one that didn't turn too good, and he'd put more turn on him. And you never rode anything out of him that didn't stop, and they were all just natural lead changers. So then when, uh, when Liz passed away, it was a, I really had to study the industry again. And I really had to look close at, at our modern horses. I love what we're doing today. I, I, I look at old videos all the time. Our horses are so much broker today. Our training has advanced uh, to the point where these horses are doing tremendously physical things. I, I remember, oh, back in the late 80s, we were at an NRHA meeting and we were all talking and Dale Wilkinson made the statement that he didn't think a horse could do any more than they were doing then. And, and you know, I, I look back, Dale was a very knowledgeable horseman. But I look back and today, I mean, these things are breaking in the back so hard and using their backs so hard and, and they're just so broke. We've went to a complete another level. So I, I looked at my breeding program and I thought, well, if, uh, you know, Wiz is, 
you, you can't take nothing away from Wiz because he's produced more money earners than any horse in the industry. But if you're gonna be smart, and you're gonna be a smart breeder, owner brain people go broke. Look at your program, think, well, what could I add to this program that would improve it? Well, I could think of three things. I'd like to put a little bit more size, a little bit more bone, a little longer neck, and the Wiz's vet check really good. They stayed sound. Uh, they're, they're easy horses to keep sound, but you had to shoe them in front every 30 days because up to 30 days their feet would grow perfectly straight and then at 30 days that toe would shoot out and they'd get way too long on the toe and it'd, put the, it, it, it'd squash their heel. I wanted a horse, and this is really hard to find, that had the old-fashioned feet the old black hoof walls that are about a quarter of an inch thick and the heel grows the same speed as the toe. Well, chromed out Mercedes had that long neck. He ha had the, si the size and the bone and he's got them old fashioned feet. So that, that was great because that, that's what we was wanting. And then the last thing that I had to have, I had to have a horse that could stop as much as a whiz. Now that really separates us. And I watched Andrea get chromed out Mercedes ready. I watched him show him. I mean, that horse was plus one every time he said, whoa. And when he wasn't plus one, he was plus one and a half. Uh, he was a monster stopper. And so, you know, once all that, but I never dreamt I could get him bought. I mean, because uh, Mark Scholes had just bought him to cross on his wimpy mares. Well, Mark's a friend, and one night he and I were talking, and, and uh, I was talking, and I, I was looking for a stud, and uh, kind of what I wanted. He says, well, I, I got the horse that would fit you. I said, yeah, I know you do, but you just bought him. He says, yeah, he said, but I've got to sell some horses. He says, there's some stuff in my private life. He said, I've got to. I've got to get rid of some horses. He says, so we, we come to a deal and I bought him right quick. And when I bought him, I probably did the most uh, in-depth vet check that's ever been done on a horse. I, I x-rayed every joint. Uh, I, had him, I had him vetted in the breeding barn. I had his frozen semen tested. I had his cooled semen tested. I had his regular semen. His semen was just off the charts, frozen, cooled, any way you wanted to go, and there was plenty of it. And so th that was all great. Because I, I think in today, uh, like OCDs and stuff like that, I, I think 50% of that's genetics hereditary. And I think 50% of it's nutrition. But I, if, I, if I'm going to put my, if, if I put my heart and soul into a stud, and I've had opportunities to sell, him, to sell him for a real good profit, but he and I are going to be together till we're done with this deal. We're going to keep going. He's not for sale. So I had to have a horse that was clean, that would be genetically clean, and I also had to have a horse, they have a, the AQHA has a deal where they will test your horses for the five genetic diseases that are out there today. So I drew blood. The only thing is they post it. I mean, anybody in the world, but if you're standing a stud to, to make yourself uh, credible, you have to disclose this stuff to be a credible breeder. So I had him tested for all five diseases. He was completely negative on all five. So everything was just the way I wanted it. So we're off and going again. Well, we're, our, fir, our oldest ones are three and go to the fraternity this year. I think uh, we probably have as nice a set of three-year-olds as I've ever had. And we sold some two-year-olds at the prospect sale last year that sold really well and I'm getting tremendous feedback from all the trainers that are riding them that they're, they're really like them. I just can't wait for the fraternity and see what happens.